It seems like we're continuing the what if Linda was in Halo series. This is a follow up on what if Linda was in Halo 3 timeline 1. As always I'm gonna shamelessly plug the second timeline because it seems like most people haven't watched it but the second timeline is three times the work three times the fun. Go watch it. Without further ado. You know where he's heading. Same place we are. When we last left off, Linda, Chief, Arbiter, and Guilty Spark were marooned in deep space after the replacement Halo fired and destroyed itself while orbiting the Ark. Guilty Spark put them to sleep in cryosleep as they were stranded in space, but as he was going to leave them drifting while he was gonna make his way back to Earth to take the portal back to the Ark, he noticed a shield world which as we know is Requiem, but due to the compartmentalization, he didn't know which shield world and exactly where he was. Guilty Spark decided to go check it out. As he travels to Requiem, he notices this shield world scans him, but does not open up to him. He wonders why the Forerunner technology doesn't seem to want to interact with him, so he flies closer until he reaches an interface. Once in contact with Requiem systems, it still refuses to open up, but the monitor has a lot of processing power after all, and it was in charge of a halo. So he bypasses some of Requiem's securities and figures out that this is the Didact's resting place. Not directly, but mostly because he realizes the world is full of Prometheans and he knows those were the warrior servants the Didact commanded. Seeing so, he decides to stay away from the Forerunner world. He returns to the Forward Onto Dawn to calculate their precise trajectory to make sure they don't accidentally stumble upon Requiem. After ensuring that he should have enough time to leave them be and rest, Without worries of stumbling into Requiem unprepared in a broken ship, the monitor sets up programs of nanobots within the cryopods. Upgrades for the Master Chief, Linda, and the Arbiter. Guilty Spark decides to take off in a direction he believes Earth is, but is slightly confused. By that, I mean he figured Earth's location with 97% accuracy on his own, but he didn't have enough data. Their interaction between jumping into slipspace and the portal from the Ark caused a scrambled mess of coordinates. That's how they ended up so close to Requiem without meaning to go to Requiem at all. Guilty Spark decides to take off at max speed. Even if he will be super drained from his power cells, he calculates getting to Earth within three years and two months. All right, I'm gonna pause here for a bit to let you know we are doing something very different here. The game is not starting with Chief, Linda, and Arbiter, but hang on for a moment and we will get there. I'm gonna take this opportunity to completely derail the story like I did with Timeline B. Again, you should check that one out, but I am still gonna stick to the games mainly. This is gonna be making a few things up very much in line in the main story, so don't go raging. The extra creativity will be back in full force for the second timeline. Mission 1. Rescue. It's been two years and four months since Guilty Spark began his journey. While at his top speed, he still hasn't made it back to Earth, but he does come across a human ship instead. The heavy cruiser, Long Night of Sorrow, comes across Guilty Spark to take him in. On board, they question Guilty Spark, and as he tells them of Sierra 117 and Sierra 058 surviving, they all wonder where he left them. They prepare to go rescue them, but Guilty Spark doesn't want to go back. He really just wants to make it back to Earth and to the portal to see his new ring. He tells the crew that whatever they do, not to go to the shield world nearby. To approach it would be welcoming the return of the most fearsome enemy humanity ever faced. The crew thinks this might be Flood. Guilty Spark is very vague about it, so the crew just ends up up wanting to leave it alone. They send out a message back to Earth with their current location and coordinates for someone to come pick up Spark and with the coordinates for forward onto Don's remains and they take off. Guilty Spark remains here in the vastness of space to wait for the other reclaimers. A slip space drive would be a big help to him after all. When the Long Night of Sorrow gets to the Forward Onto Dawn, they have drifted predictably into where Guilty Spark had calculated. But once they get there, they come across Jul and Dama's forces. As they had been near and around the shield world trying to access it for some time before the Forward Onto Dawn drifted close enough to the planet to begin opening up. Now that both the Long Night of Sorrow and the Reformed Covenant battle group are aware of each other, the Long Night of Sorrow is a heavy cruiser, and with upgrades from the post-war discoveries, the human ship is in a much more even footing with the Covenant ships. But this ship is still no infinity, so it tries and struggles, but it still gets overwhelmed by the forces of Jewel and Dama. With only four Spartan force on board the cruiser, they manage to fight off the Covenant boarding them, but they can't affect the space battle. Once it's evident they're gonna lose, the captain sends out the Spartans on two pelicans to the forward onto Dawn. The Covenant had become aware of the half-destroyed ship while the Long Night of Sorrow had been trying to rescue it. So basically two years earlier than the original Halo 4. So let's do a small recap. The mission consists of you playing as a Spartan 4 to stave off the onboarding Covenant forces. 
much like the first mission of Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2. After the Spartan Force got on the Pelicans to go to the Forward Onto Dawn, one is shot down by the Covenant, so two Spartan Force are on it immediately killed. But the other Pelican isn't destroyed however, it is damaged, so the Spartan Force on board have to ditch it and free float on to the Forward Onto Dawn. Once on board, they kill all the Covenant forces trying to get to the survivors in cryo and they wake up Chief and Linda. Ready to get back to work? I thought you'd never ask. Mission 2 Dawn. Once awake, the Spartan force inform the survivors of what's going on and how they found them. The Arbiter is confused as to why there even is a Covenant left and the Spartan force tell them about Jewel and Dama. There will be time to explain later, they say. The plan is pretty much what Chief was gonna do with Cortana. Get on board one of the ships and try to hijack it. Linda notices the upgrades from their nanobots. Her suit now has a cloaking unit. She can now go invisible for a short time. Chief's suit will allow him to sprint indefinitely without getting tired as well as the thrust bags. And Arbiter has a new shiny forerunner looking arm. Also his camo lasts a lot longer than before. Along with the Spartan Force, they clear all the Covenant forces left on board and the ones that keep on boarding them. Once we get here, where usually Chief has to fight these boarding guys, they instead see the remains of the Long Night of Sorrow as the Covenant finished destroying it after the Spartans left. Well, they have an elite amongst them, so they decide to impersonate the Covenant. The Arbiter pretends to be one of the Covenant's elites, and using their comms, he sends out an all-clear signal. When they come get retrieved, the Covenant forces notice it's the Arbiter, and some immediately try to fight him, but a few see the Forerunner arm, and they refuse to attack. Since the Covenant are still fanatics of the Forerunners, Seeing the Arbiter with a Forerunner technology arm means he is like a walking demigod to some. They use this to their advantage. After killing the ones who fought them, the Arbiter tells them he will challenge Jewel and Dama for the right to lead them. They are taken to one of the Covenant's ships, and once on board, the ship's captain informs Jewel and Dama. But like the coward he is, instead of wanting to 1v1 me bro to the Arbiter, he has his ship start attacking the one the Arbiter is on and his company. While the ship to ship battle is going on though, they drift into the range of the opening of Requiem, and the ship is scanned by the shield world. After detecting several reclaimers on board, the world begins to open up and suck in all the ships around. Same as in the original. Ships come crashing into Requiem, but this Covenant ship they were on has taken a lot of damage at this point, and it begins breaking apart in orbit. The Spartan Force die upon entering the planet. Their Mjolnir armor isn't as strong as Chief and Linda's. The Arbiter manages to survive just barely as he enters an elite drop pod just in time to be launched to the surface instead of crashing. Mission 3 Requiem This mission starts as Chief wakes up from the crash amongst the rubble of the Covenant ship. There's parts of the Forward Onto Dawn also all over the place. Once Requiem opened up, it sucked all the remains. The first priority for Chief is to find Linda and Arbiter. He sets his comms open to transmit Spartan signal Ole Ole Oxen Free. But something is jamming communications. Chief sets up to high ground knowing Linda would do the same. Once he gets here to see the Forerunner structure, he realizes high ground might be difficult but just like in the original, he starts picking up signals. It's nothing he can understand yet, but he wants to find a way down to the Forerunner facility. Surely both Linda and the Arbiter would be able to see this giant structure and head there too. An overview of the area is his best option. As he traverses the terrain, he has to fight several Covenant forces. Pretty much the same scenario. But once he gets here, it's the Arbiter's pod that's down there. Crash landed in a strange position and now the Arbiter is stuck inside and the Covenant has surrounded him. First task is to clear out the Covenant and get the Arbiter out of his drop pod. Chief finally clears out the area after taking down two phantoms full of enemies and a group of hunters that were deployed to the area to stop Chief from opening the Arbiter's pod. Once free, they make their way forward to where the cartographer is. As Chief keeps picking up signals, this part of the mission happens the same though, just with the Arbiter and his fancy new arm blade to make things go by faster. They activate the localized cartographer, but as is, they can't get much info out of it, but the sentinels do come to help them. The sentinels start guiding them through the next section. Only once they get here, it's a bunch of dead bodies and some crashed banshees. There's no fight here for them, so they keep going into the next area, where once again, there's a bunch of Covenant dead bodies. But this time, they can hear shots. It sounds like a sniper rifle and Chief's armor picks up another signal, an indistinguishable... He tells the Arbiter that they must hurry and head up there, but just as he is done saying that, she comes up the edge and see them from up there. Once they get up to her, they regroup and talk about how they need a ship to get off this world and head back home. So they plan on setting a trap for the Covenant to come pick them up, thinking once again that it's one of their own forces. But the Covenant realizes it's them. Their state of mind is, why would they be trying to get back to the ship if they finally made it into Requiem? So they send reinforcements instead. Chief, Linda, and Arbiter don't know that the Covenant has been waiting for years to 
try to get into Requiem. Why would any of them want to leave now? There is a group of Zealot-like elites that come down after them, but even with the advanced shields and the tactics, they don't stand a chance against two Spartan twos and the upgraded Arbiter. After the fight is done, they start getting transmissions from the Infinity. The Long Night of Sorrow sent out word and the UNSC knew it was Guilty Spark. The Infinity was sent. In this timeline, the Halo Ring was fired killing everything in the solar system. That includes everyone in the Oort Cloud. This is where the Infinity was during the conflicts of Halo 3, as it wasn't done being built. And because of that, the ship took a lot longer to finish. Yes, they got help from engineers, but everyone that was in the whole solar system got wiped out of existence. So this time, this is Infinity's second mission. It has barely just finished its mission of moving the composer to the Ivanov station. They wanted to start out with something easy and not combat oriented. This time, it is Captain Lasky controlling it, as the Rio was on board the Infinity during the construction and died from the Halo firing. Now, some of you might be wondering, why would Lasky be alive then? We know he was flying a Banshee in the fight on the moon during the events of Halo 3, so wouldn't he be killed by the Halo? My answer is no. Once Earth was overtaken by the arrival of flood ships, all human and elite ships tried to dip, so they all began to flee. The flood left a few forces on Earth, which took over Earth and started the spread of a flood to Luna, but by then they had been evacuated. All human and covenant forces were trying to keep the flood contained to Earth, but when the halo began to come through the portal, they all left the solar system as fast as they could. Unfortunately, there was no time to save everyone on board the Infinity, as its slip space drive hadn't been installed and it could not escape, and with it being on the Oort Cloud, they thought they were safe from the flood, especially with, with Infinity's shield and guns. We also know Palmer was recovering from her needler wound, but there's no direct info on where the medical station is, so for the purpose of this what if, she is currently alive. With that out of the way, the Infinity has arrived and is under the exact same situation. Chief and Linda don't want it to get caught up by the planet's gravity controls, and so they set out to find a way to get the message out to them. They come to the Citadel and try to access the transit system like in the original, but without an AI, it's very rudimentary. They only manage to activate a portal, or you know, so they think. We know this is the Didact, but they think they made a portal. And surrounded by knights, they decide they'll risk it and jump through. Mission 4, Forerunner. This mission is essentially the same except with two companions. They have to take out the relays in order to amplify the signal. It just takes them longer to figure out what to do since there's no Cortana here. While trying to figure it all out though, the portal opens up once again. It's the Didact. This time though, they know it wasn't them who opened it up. So they begin to think, one, it could be an ambush leading to them dying. But if it was, there was a chance to escape it at least. Two, if it's not an ambush, someone is helping them. They all get ready as they enter the portal. If it's an ambush, they want to be prepared, but it all goes as usual. They get teleported and start making their way to the first pylon. Once the knight lands on top of Chief, Linda shoots it and Arbiter cuts it with its arm. As he goes to cut the knight, the knight catches his blade with his own, at which point it teleports away and stops attacking him. For the rest of the mission, the knights stay away from them. They seem to believe the Arbiter is one of them, but that doesn't mean the Covenant stays out of their way. It just means that all the fights against the knights are up against Covenant this time. Once they get to the first pylon and they destroy it, they split up as there's three of them, and you gotta destroy three power cores. Everything in this whole mission is essentially the same, really, as when they get to the second pylon, they once again have to destroy the cores. Only this time, the knights do fight them, but only because they are protecting the course. When we get to this section and shut down the second pylon, it becomes clear to them that whatever is opening up the portals is helping them and not sending them to get ambushed. Once they get to the cryptum and they believe it's a satellite, they want to shut it down. So once again, they reawaken the didact. Only this time, there's three of them. The Arbiter doesn't actually want to fight the didact since he still sees the Forerunners as a pseudo-god race. Even if he knows the Great Journey was a lie, but he helps out Chief and Linda. They shoot at the didact, but he kind of just brushes it off. Once again, he uses the Cryptum to get out of there and go back to Infinity. The mission ends essentially the same as Chief, Linda, and Arbiter use ghosts to escape the reformation of Requiem. The Librarian portal opens up to save them, which leads them here to this cutscene. Just insert Linda and Arbiter in there as well. Mission 5, Infinity. This mission starts out generally the same, except the Didact damaged the Infinity a lot more this time around. This is different than the original because the Didact didn't want to destroy the Infinity or hurt it at all, but here the Didact had the Spartans and the Arbiter oppose him the moment he woke up, so he wants to take as few chances as possible. They gotta make their way through the jungle. This time, the friend of foe tags they find from crashed pelicans and hornets and longswords, not because a team was sent out, so their path through the jungle is completely different. They don't run into Captain Lasky out in the jungle though. So we thankfully don't get the 
I thought you'd be taller. Lasky's main priority was to defend the Infinity, so all hands on board are there to fight the Covenant, Prometheans and the Krypton. The group does manage to get in contact with them though, at one of the downed Pelicans. Lasky wants them on board the Infinity as soon as possible, so he, he sends the coordinates on how to get to them. Once they get to the entrance where we usually roll through with the tank, they have to walk most of it, but Lasky does send out a Pelican for them to get there faster. While all the Spartan force are still on board, they are protecting the Infinity. Lasky has Chief, Linda, and Arbiter land on top of the Infinity so they can make their way to reactivate the weapons and stop the Krypton from taking the info from the ship. Only change from this is that the Infinity is more damaged and since Linda's group had to walk a while longer in the previous section, it took a while to get to the Infinity. On the outer hull though, this section goes by almost the same, except without a Mantis. Not to worry though, the captain sends them reinforcements as they had more forces on board to repel the Covenant and Prometheans this time. The backup does indeed come in the shape of Mantis as Manti? Mantellinis? Manti. Anyway, the end cutscene is similar, except without Rio being a dumbass here. This time, Captain Lasky also gets reports from Sarah Palmer, but their intent isn't to leave. It's only so they can get the Infinity free from the gravity well. They acknowledge that they had the Didact on the run, so they will follow him, but they can't follow him right now. They need to do some repairs and take care of all the inner damage and people who died and got hurt on the attack, and the gravity well is in their way to follow the Didact anyway. Mission 6, Reconnaissance. This mission starts with Lasky sending Linda, the best markswoman in the UNSC, on a recon mission to where we shut down the particle cannons. She instead goes with Palmer, as she tends to be a lone wolf, Linda has very mixed feelings about Palmer since she is a Spartan, but clearly not a Spartan that she knows of anyway. Throughout the mission, they talk about what has been happening on Earth after Linda and Chief fire the Halo. Palmer tells her that Johnson and the elites on the other half of the forward onto Dawn escaped the firing of the ring and then rallied with what's left of the UNSC to bring the people back to Earth and to the soul colonies. That took a very long time, but an injured Johnson was leading the charge on this. The UNSC he wanted to promote him, but he refused his promotion. He stated that his purpose was helping people, and if he was promoted anymore, he would be pushing a pencil behind a desk. The surviving heads of the UNSC disagreed with him, knowing the rebels would want to strike now more than ever since the war with the Covenant had started. Well, now the war is over. Instead, they placed him on Earth pretty much in charge of the entire planet. As the UNSC pulled back almost all support from the outer colonies to refortify Earth and the solar system, they lost a ton of support from the outer colonies, but this allowed them to re-establish Earth as a superpower and not to mention finishing building the Infinity, although this time it took a few more years as there is just so many less people available, even with the help of the engineers. This whole mission is taking place at night and has the same vibe as Nightfall from Halo Reach. Linda wants to know about the other Spartans, so she questions Palmer. As far as she knows, most Spartans made it off Earth and were saved from the Halo, but Palmer also explains that Spartan Force were basically ODSTs trained and augmented at which Linda can only think to herself, where are the Spartan 3s? They then get cut off from one another as Linda heads in to shut down the particle cannons, though without bringing an AI she can't do it. So she does the next best thing and separates them from the overall network on Requiem. They will still target anything trying to leave or enter the planet or flying too close, but the Infinity should be safe for long range support. This also means that their targeting systems won't bring down a lot of good pelicans in the next mission. Once that happens though, the Sentinels block Linda's path, they want her to follow. So the next Next course of events is the exact same that happened to the chief. She meets the librarian and the cutscene is almost the exact same, except after she asks the librarian to do the same gene song manipulation to all of humanity, the librarian tells Lynn that she cannot, that humans haven't evolved enough. Only a very few of them would have reached this evolution by now. She's basically talking about the Spartan 2s. Linda, worried that the Composer, the Didact's ultimate weapon, will hurt Chief, plans to bring him here. After the cutscene plays out, Palmer comes on the radio screaming. Linda's vitals jumped all over the place just like Chief's do. After she tells her that she disabled the particle cannon's long range targeting and separated them from the network, Palmer says they should go. All of this was happening while Palmer was doing recon of the area, so they could have a map and know what's what and where. They have to fight their way back to the pelican they had hidden away. But before they regroup though, Linda jams her knife into a dead elite and starts using its blood as paint. She paints on a rock O-O-O-F and inside the O's are numbers. When they reach the pelican, 
They head back to the Infinity, while Palmer informs Linda on more of what's been transpiring on Earth, Johnson, and the UNSC for the last few years. The mission ends as Lasky decides to deploy several mammoths down to go shut down the particle cannons. One mammoth led by Palmer and Chief, and the other by Linda and the Arbiter. Mission 7, Reclaimer. This mission starts out almost the same, Chief on a Pelican alongside Arbiter, Linda and Palmer though. The Pelican drops off Palmer and Chief at the first mammoth and it takes off to drop the Arbiter and Linda at a different one. They will push on one cannon each and meet where Linda saw the terminal to deactivate the other two particle cannons with the help of Roland. This mission goes on very similar as usual, except these Pelicans here at the beginning don't get destroyed since Linda disabled targeting to the particle cannons and they aren't actively shooting at them. They manage to paint the cannons as targets just as planned. But once they get here, where the first pelican got shot down as original, Chief sees some rocks painted and smeared with purple blood. Some other marines and even Palmer notice this, but they all question what it means. Palmer is suspicious because that's clearly done by a human, but the only ones who would have been here would have been Linda and her. With the numbers inside the O's, Chief figures out that must be a frequency range. A private frequency for Linda to contact him. Roland, having seen through the chief, immediately figures it out and starts keeping tabs on the conversation. Throughout the mission, Linda keeps on contacting Chief through the secured radio network. She tells him that there's something important he has to see, but he needs to split from the others. The next time she contacts him, it's to tell him when they get there, they won't have much time and they'll have to be smart about it. The next time she contacts him is right before they regroup, where we usually fight the Lich Except by the time we get there, the Arbiter is already on board the Lich and we can see through the windows. He is cutting through any opposition on board. Linda signals Chief and she says that they will push forward until the Mammoths can catch up. Palmer has now realized they are up to something. But Linda doesn't give her time to make any decisions. She takes off sprinting at full speed and Chief goes after her. On their way to the facility, Linda is quickly taking care of all the snipers while Chief takes care of the rest. Once Chief and Linda make it to the coordinates and disable the particle cannons just like Cortana does in the regular, this time it's Roland though. Everything else happens pretty much the same but in a hurry. Linda takes Chief to where the librarian AI can unlock his genetic codes and tells him she will explain as soon as she can. Time moves slower for them while interacting with the librarian AI but not enough to avoid unwanted questions. Once it's all done, they're exiting the facility when Palmer catches up to them. She was trying to find out what they were doing, but it was too late. She starts to distrust them, but she has no proof of anything being wrong. Chief is wondering why Linda made him get that kind of instant operation thing done, and not anyone else. But they don't get a chance to talk now as the Infinity is getting torn up and trying to get to the f gravity well. The end of the mission is the same, only now Linda and the Arbiter help. Palmer is guarding the mammoths while the rest paint the target. When the Arbiter catches up with them, he smells the air and says to the chief, Your scent is different. He has already noticed it with Linda, but he wasn't sure if it was something about the area, but with Chief having gone through the same change, he knows something is different. The mission ends quite differently though. Once on board the Infinity, they aren't ready to take the mission to the Didact yet, since Infinity took a lot of damage again during the mission, but they aren't planning on going anywhere. Palmer asks Lasky for a word in private, while Chief, Linda, and the Arbiter leave the bridge. She wants to warn Lasky that Linda and Chief are keeping secrets. That being said though, Lasky doesn't doesn't care much since he trusts Chief and Roland reassures him that it's nothing big. But he does have Palmer keep an eye out on them because they were very very buddy buddy with the Arbiter. Now I want to touch on some of the events between Halo 3 and 4, or at least my version of Halo 3 and 4. While the Arbiter was presumed dead, Elite splintered off into a lot more factions than regular. The inner conflicts and politics of the Sanhili led them to end the truce with the humans. There may have not been a war against humanity, but the Elites aren't their friends either. This is why Jul and Dama's Covenant are still so strong, because a lot of Elites joined him instead of the Swords of Sanhelios. So there's a lot of mistrust between the humans and Elites. Mission 8, Shutdown. The goal of this mission is once again going to the towers and disabling the Didact's Cryptum defenses. But the intention this time is for an attack from the Infinity. Infinity may still be damaged, but their best chance to stop the Didact is finishing him off here. They use two Pelicans to head to the Communication Relays Tower, Chief and Linda on one and Palmer plus the Arbiter on the other. Palmer wants to keep an eye on them, but she would rather split them up in case they are up to no good. What she fails to understand is that the Spartan 2s are not traitors by any means. This mission proceeds as usual though, while Chief and Linda 
clear out the first tower, they have to discuss everything the librarian told Linda. Ancient humanity, the forerunner wars with them and the flood, the gene song and everything to overcome the composer. But even they don't know how the composer works or what the composer really does. After clearing out the towers, they once more go to the central room to have the spires move in to block the cryptum from leaving. At least now the shields are down, so the infinity starts to fight the cryptum. The chief, Linda, Arbiter and Palmer make it to the control room, but before they can move the spires to block the cryptum, it begins to move. They all think it's about to run away from the infinity, but instead it heads down into Mantle's approach. The didact already knew where the composer was, the only reason he was even waiting was for the Covenant's forces to rally up on him, but coming under fire means he has to leave. When he starts to leave, the group has no time, so instead it chases the cryptum into the Mantle's approach. And just how they take the Slipstace portal in the original on board a Lich, they go on board a Pelican this time. Mission 9 Composer. This mission starts off the same, but with a pelican, they safely dock and begin to move throughout Ivanov Station. While on their way in Slipstays, Palmer told them everything about the Composer and the Infinity's mission to bring it to Ivanov Station. This time, they will be ready when they get there. Palmer also used this time to confront Chief, Linda, and the Arbiter about what they were hiding. The Arbiter had no idea they were hiding anything besides the fact that Chief and Linda seemed different. At this point, the Arbiter finds out just about what's been going on with the Zenheili. They had lied to him on board the Infinity to keep tensions down. The Arbiter and Palmer will fight through the station to stop the Covenant, so essentially, they do everything Chief does in the mission. Only difference is Linda is with them until they rescue the personnel and secure a rally point for them. Chief will go directly to the armory and secure the nukes, while Linda helps evacuate the people and operates the station's defenses. Once the Didact starts scanning the Composer, Chief is actually ready with the nukes. They plant four on the Composer, one each, and as the Didact is retrieving it, they blow them up with the intention to also disable the mantle's approach. But the didact was repaired, the composer is intact, with four on their shields extending from the mantle's approach. The didact gives a speech taunting them, similar to the end of Halo 4. And yet, still you fail. The didact activates the composer on Ivanov Station. This sequence, when people get turned to dust layer by layer, happens again. Palmer's armor just crumbles in front of Linda, Chief, Linda, and the Arbiter are knocked unconscious. The Arbiter's physiology saves him. He's too different from the humans to be composed, at least for now, since it wasn't targeting him. But it still puts him unconscious. When they wake up, if you can recall from the original Halo 5 campaign, there is five nukes, Cortana says. This time, Chief says there's still one left in the armory, and they go get it. They prepare a few broadswords and pull the same stunt as the original. They get in close to the mantle's approaches, shields, and since they are unable to board it right now, they split up to find an entrance to the ship. Mission 10. Midnight. Once in slip space, usually Chief starts to make his way to the Composer and Didact with Cortana's help. This is almost the exact same though. Even without Cortana, there's three of them spread out through the Forerunner ship, so they are bound to find the Composer. But since there is three of them this time, when they get to Earth and the UNSC is fighting back against the Mantle's approach, they manage to take out all the cannons faster. The Infinity made it back to Earth just like in the original, especially since the Didact took off and they saw the Mantle's approach. They came back to Earth to warn everyone. Although I would like to say they are more prepared this time, the truth is Earth is still not back to 100%, but President of Earth, Avery Johnson, has been setting up Forerunner reverse engineering technology around Earth's orbit. So the Forerunner ship will have a tougher time getting in range since there are three broadswords and everything was way faster. There's no crash like in the original one. Instead they land normally. The Didax ship is reforming itself all over to stop the broadsword with a nuke. So Linda and Arbiter will go deeper into the ship to disable its ability to reshape, while Chief guards the nuke. So the mission is almost essential essentially the same once we're on board, with Linda and Arbiter running around the ship fighting knights. Once they clear a path for the broadsword though, Chief tells Linda and the Arbiter on the radio that the Dagdad is at the broadsword. Linda and the Arbiter hurry back to Chief. By the time they get there though, they activate their cloaking units. The Dagdad's armor has adapted to all weapons Chief tried on him. The Dagdad taunts Chief again and activates the composer. Sorry new phoenix. For those of you who don't know, the Dagdad's armor adapts to weapons and that's why they can't fight him. That's covered in Halo Escalation the comics. At this point, Linda's weapons are useless too, but what he wasn't counting on was the blade from the Arbiter's new arm. Guilty Spark had programmed the Nanites in such a way that would be a perfect blade, similar to the Promethean Knights but with a few differences. That came in mind based on the ancient Forerunner Flood War. Since the Flood had used their own weapons against them, they constantly had to be reinventing their own technology just to stand a small chance. This was such a case. This is a long way to say that the Arbiter cuts off the Didact's arm and stabs him in the stomach before the Didact can react and adapt. 
adapt. That being the case though, the Arbiter's blade is stuck inside the Direct, so he breaks it off the Arbiter's arm and stabs him with it. The Arbiter is bleeding and his armor is thoroughly compromised. With the Didact heavily injured, Chief and Linda take to the last resort, brute force. They tackle the Didact and try to fight him, but he is still overpowering them. Linda does the same as the original, when Chief puts a grenade in his armor and blows him up. The Didact is sent reeling back. He is not dead, but clearly he has been extremely injured. They have the Arbiter get on the broadsword and they use their Mjolnir armor to jump off the ship and into space, while the Arbiter pilots the broadsword directly into the composer to deploy the nuke. The game ends as such, with the final cutscene being Chief and Linda falling from the ship and into space. I guess it's not really falling, since you know, there's no falling in space, but they have their armor locked and they're outside the ship's range from the nuke. The Arbiter is clinging to life while Linda and Chief are rescued inside their armors. And because to hell with that ancient super advanced lunatic, he's gone, no more Halo escalation problems. I mean. He just took an arm getting cut off, stabbed, grenaded in the face, and a nuke. So I think even a forerunner, God of War, is dying. The most important outcomes from this are that Earth is no longer safe. In the eyes of humanity anyway. No one wants to live on Earth, especially after the flood, the halo firing, and now the new Phoenix incident. So Johnson is gonna have an extremely hard time convincing people it's safe after the flood and everything. Because there is less interest in people being on Earth, someone to live on the Ark. Those people would lead the discovery of an AI all thought was dead. Though this will take years, beyond the 7 year mark, for that special AI's mind to work properly. On top of all this, insurrectionists are stronger than ever, because people's disillusionment with Earth and the United Earth government has been at an all time low. The Arbiter is alive and once he heals up and his arm gets repaired, he will return to San Helios and claim the title of Arbiter as it once was. With this arm, his intellect, battle prowess and his connections, he will unite the elites once more and the conflict against humanity will start to re shape from there. Now the elites won't be hostile and real peace can come over the galaxy except for you know inspired others people a chance to be more than they are naturally thank you for watching check out the rest of the what ifs subscribe like comment was my voice not as bad this time around with this mic let me know have a great day bye our duty as soldiers is to protect humanity whatever the cost